Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software Great Tech Group. You're invited to join our conversation to model the future of construction, innovation, and the digital transformation adventure of this great industry. My guest today is Waleed Zafar. He's the mission critical director of the construction technology company XYZ Reality. It's the company behind the Atom, the world's first engineering grade augmented reality headset. While he joined XYZ Reality as its first employee and has led the development of the Atom across all major projects in Europe. Welcome to the show, Wally. Glad to be on, Todd. Uh, yeah, looking forward to this conversation. So before we kind of really dive into the, the world of AR and XYZ Reality, how'd you get into the industry to begin with? Uh, so a bit of a funny story. Uh, I was actually and my background is actually in finance so i come from a mergers and acquisition m a background okay. kind of corporate corporate finance through and through so what ended up happening was that um kind of left that world went to go pursue a master's at london business school and uh, during my first week there i bump into this tall crazy irishman right and he told me about this vision he had of builders building from holograms and getting rid of 2d drawings now i don't come from construction i don't come from tech uh but I thought conceptually the idea sounded pretty cool. So I thought, yeah, why not? So I ended up joining him at that point, David Mitchell, and uh, joined him as the first employee. So that's kind of how I ended up uh, joining XYZ. And when I joined, we only had the idea on a piece of paper. Uh, we didn't have anything developed out. We wasn't sure exactly how we were going to do it, but we kind of knew um, overall the journey that we needed to take. So yeah, it was pretty interesting times. Very interesting. So uh, what... Coming from a finance background, what gripped you about the world of construction more generally and AR specifically? Yeah, so given the fact that I had absolutely no idea about anything to do with construction at that point in time, um, went home, did my homework, right? And I could clearly see the opportunity at hand. And essentially, the way I did the math was that, okay, I looked at, you know, how large is the industry? Well, it's actually the largest in the world, right? Okay, how digitized is this industry? It's the second least digitized industry, uh, second only to agriculture. And I was like, okay, we'll put two and two together. That means that there's a huge opportunity um, for this industry to be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And uh, conceptually, the idea of builders building from holograms and kind of getting rid of 2D drawings and kind of it's simple enough conceptually and uh, makes sense as well, you know, given the fact that, you know, we're 3D creatures operate in a 3D environment. And so I was uh, like, okay, I think this is probably the best way forward as well for this industry. So that's why I ended up joining. Yeah. Interesting. What, what do you think was maybe one of the, the biggest hurdles that, that you had to overcome coming into the construction with kind of fresh eyes or, um, you know, something that was unexpected? Yeah. Uh, I think knowledge for sure. Just like my knowledge gap was massive when I first joined, right? Just, I had, you know, very little understanding of construction, let alone kind of, you know, specific construction projects, sequences, materials, um, challenges, different roles, different kind of, uh, industries within the construction space, you know, uh, different billing cycles, different business models. So I think it was just the knowledge in general was quite <laughs> a steep learning curve for me to go through. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there's plenty of information out there online, watched a, a hell of a lot of YouTube, uh, read a lot of books, and, and that kind of helped upskill me pretty fast. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so kind of shifting into AR, what's a, a, a misconception that, that people have when it comes to the world of, of augmented reality? So I'd say uh, biggest misconception that I see is that it's a gimmick. Like it's just a, it's a fun gaming tool. Right. Mm -hmm. As in, you know, like we kind of see the sci fi movies, right? And, you know, it's, it looks so cool in sci fi movies, right? They're like, I understand the applications, et cetera. But we, everybody thinks, like, ah, that's like, you know, donkey's ears away, right? Yeah. And so I think the biggest misconception is actually seeing real world applications as of today, right? And like industrial grade applications. I know it's not at the consumer level yet, and it won't be for, you know, many a decade, I'm, I'm sure, but eventually we'll get there. But kind of to start with, there are many industrial applications, and that's going to be the biggest driver for AR uh, across the world. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think, uh, kind of overcoming that uh, misconception, 
what do people need to do when they, they, they start trying to implement that? They're, they're bought in, that they're, they want to test it out. What do they need to do to, to kind of have that, that first low-hanging fruit to bring it into their toolbox? Yeah. Um, I think taking a sandbox approach is really, really important, right? So like if, if I'm a construction company and I'm, and you know, someone approaches me and say, Hey, cool. Like, you know, we've got this amazing AR headset, like we want to try it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to kind of create an environment through which you can create, um, a true testing ground, right? You want to stress test it completely. You want to know, okay, I want to know how large the models it can load. How accurate is it? Right. I want to get feedback from um, kind of all the different stakeholders on a project, you know, from project directors down to, you know, superintendents and foremen and actually just the builders themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. If you can create that sandbox environment, create an environment where you can pilot it, right. Invite them in, do like a three, six month study, whatever it is, and go through that experience then. And then ultimately what will happen is that you come out the other side and you go, okay, like, I get it. I see the value for it, but unfortunately, like it didn't meet ABC goals, right? I can then communicate that feedback or I can just actually just look online, research. Is there an alternative out there that can actually fulfill those requirements? But that's really like the approach that every construction business should be taking when it comes to deploying AR and actually, to be honest with you, deploying any kind of tech solutions. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I see one of the, the biggest stumbling blocks of of people when they're adopting technology is that they don't take the time to map out their goals on the front side. And so they, they think that they're going to bring in this software or, or piece of technology and that's a, a cure all. And let's just roll it out and implement it and uh, it's going to fix everything. But if you don't have that, that plan and the, the roadmap of, of where you're wanting to go, how do you ever know if you, you get there or, or needing to adjust and, and pivot along the way as you're rolling it out as well? Yeah, big time. Like so often, um, you know, every construction company is already under resource, right? So everybody's already at 130% capacity. Then you throw in a new piece of tech at them and go, right, figure it out. Like it's not going to land very well, right? right. It's not going to be adopted very well. It's not going to be optimal. Like you haven't considered all sides and angles, right? So you kind of need to figure out, okay, how am I actually going to truly test this out? Right. And so you want to be looking at, okay, how can the tech company actually facilitate this? Do they need to bring boots on the ground, right? To be able to showcase and prove its value. Like, okay, who from my team can, has enough capacity to be able to champion this going forward as well? Mm -hmm. You know, is this a technology that I'm supposed to be using every day, for several hours a day, or is this like a once a month piece of technology? If so, like I need to look at my resources and see who's got capacity for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it just, won't fly and and you know that's why everybody kind of gets burnt you know in the industry when it comes to new tech yeah yeah absolutely more than agree uh, are there certain kind of common goals of companies that that you see when they're uh, embracing ar that if you have this goal maybe you're set up more for success or uh, a goal that uh, is is drawing them into uh, adopting it and trying out ar more yeah uh, typically, the use case that we see is around uh, coordination in the field. So coordination between different trade partners mm -hmm. uh, out on site and being able to kind of foresee clashes, um, foresee where there might be rework activities, etc. They're the typical use cases that we actually see. And mm -hmm. so like, you know, perfect example is kind of, you know, uh, MEPs about a kickoff and, and the old, you know, first in best dress happens, right? The first trade contractor gets in, kind of throws in their set of works and then everybody else comes in thereafter and they're going, right, you know, I can't work around this. So next thing you know, tools are down, redesigns taking place, or they're just going to throw it in whatever they want. And the next thing you know, your design's kind of going out the window. Right. So everybody's kind of experienced that and say, that's a really nice immediate first use case. Everybody puts on their headsets, everybody puts on AR and they can just visually see, they go, ah, that's where it actually should be. And this is where it is. We've got a problem. Let me flag it straight away before anybody, and the next trade partner gets in, we can actually just go through and rectify the works itself. And yeah. so, so that's probably like the most common one I've seen. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's dig a, a little deeper into that. How you mentioned it a, a bit there, but how can AR really help to, to eliminate that, that rework? on the job site and, and have a real world impact. Yeah. So 
the if we okay so let's, if we peel back what is ar ar is like a digital overlay against the real world right mm -hmm. so it's, think of it like a heads up display so what you want to be able to do and how it actually operates in the field is being able to take that 3d design model and port it and visually see it in context out on site right and that's really really important so the way you would see it in AR is that you'd see it in the form of a hologram. Sounds super sci-fi, uh, but it's it's actually happening, right? So you see in the form of a hologram, you can see where the installations are supposed to be taking place. And then it becomes a, a really easy game of Lego, right? If you can see what you need to build, you're going to build it right the first time. Build it right the first time, you eliminate the reworking clashes. So what ends up happening is that you avoid kind of going uh, like in a different direction versus what's designed for. Because the design models typically clash free, you know, it's been coordinated well and truly. Like if you stick to the design, it will be installed accordingly. And and therefore you will eliminate the rework. And so that's kind of how AR is able to eliminate rework from the field itself. Yeah. Interesting. Well, what's the what's the future potential of AR? If we we're looking out, you know, let's say ten years. What's the the world of AR in construction look like? Sure. So AR in construction, right? For it to be valuable, you have to be able to load up large models and position them with millimeter accuracy, right? They're the two biggest drivers for AR in construction. And the reason why is because construction tolerances are, you know, uh, like five to 10 millimeters, you know, a, a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch at times, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's from the accuracy perspective. And then from the model perspective, you know, these projects are getting larger and larger. They're getting more and more complex. Therefore, the models are getting denser. So you need to be able to have a solution that can load up these large scale models, mm -hmm. right? So if kind of keeping those two points as like the North Star, right? So where can we kind of go from there? So as of today, like we can position a model super accurately in the field. We can load up large scale models super accurately. But where we want to get to is a stage where it's as cheap as an iPhone, right? Every builder in the world has one, right? He just throws it on. He can visualize a model out on site. He can conduct his activities for the day. And he's only seeing the holograms of exactly what activities he's supposed to be installing in the field today. So it's then bringing in the intelligence aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. And then when he's done with it, you know, it's automatically captured everything he's done. It's verified everything that he's done. It's actually fed that information back to the wider team. Everybody's got the green light. It's already been signed off because he's installed it right the first time. It's automatically populated the checklist because everything's synced together. And then he can go home and conduct it the next day accordingly. So that's kind of ultimately where we see it going. Um, yeah. and kind of where we are today is here. So we'll get there. Yeah. So how do we get there? So scale, scale is a really, really big factor in all of this. Um, because as whatever happens with any new technologies first gets developed, it's on the cutting edge, it's expensive, right? But then over time, when more and more people adopt it, scale is achieved. And you also have to wait for the, like any other piece of new tech, right? The supply chain also has to be able to scale accordingly. Mm -hmm. When they scale, every AR solution provider such as us, we're also able to scale. We scale as well as a business. We're able to then drive down the cost and those transfer across. So that's kind of like a, a big uh, component of how do we get there? Yeah, nice. So uh, uh, address the kind of the person in the room that says, yeah, it's, it's really cool technology, but not practical yet going back to that misconception that you talked about earlier it's not practical on the job site yeah. uh, how do you uh, address that person and, and kind of show them no this is incredibly viable and happening now sure uh so i'd always look at it okay what, what's the challenges that are actually happening on all of our job sites right what's the themes of our challenges right and i always come back to it's like kind of three main themes um starting off with kind of there's a general need to be able to ensure project certainty, right? So how can we de-risk the project from being delayed or going through cost overruns, right? Mm -hmm. And I think everybody can agree in, uh, that that's something that they're looking to resolve for. Second thing then is around labor shortages, right? And it's not just labor shortages in terms of like boots on the ground, but it's also labor shortages in terms of construction management guys as well, right? Because what's ended up happening is that the industry is exploding. And so you have to promote inexperienced guys into experienced people's roles. 
and what ends up happening is that they don't have the level of experience to be able to deliver these projects on time to budget. And it's through no fault of their own, right? They've been put into this position mm-hmm. and, and they've not been equipped with the tools and to be able to do so. And so what ends up happening is that you might have one project in, you know, one part of the world that's gone brilliant and the next one in another part of the world that's gone a complete disaster. And so you end up with this like inconsistent quality as a result. And I think like those three main themes, like they're all the challenges I think everybody faces on their job sites. So kind of if I'm speaking to someone and they're going, I don't see the practical use, right? You're going, okay, if you're experiencing these three challenges, then I know for a fact that, you know, 30% of your construction activities are actually rework activities, right? And if you think about that, then you're going, right, so 30% of the human capital time that's allocated towards delivering a project is actually spent on fixing issues that could have been built right the first time. Like that is the largest opportunity in the room. Yeah, oh, for sure. And so being able to drive that down, like that's the key. And then you want to be able to show that, right? And so the way we show it actually is that we don't ship out a piece of tech and go off you go, right? Because we know that everybody's at 130% capacity. Yeah. What we do is actually provide a managed service. So we actually provide engineers, boots on the ground, who actually utilize the technologies. And they actually utilize the headset, inspect all the quality of the works, ensure everything's been built right the first time, and feed that information back to the wider project team. So what ends up happening is that the project team then get all the value without having to do the legwork, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. We take that, we take that off them. And then it just ensures that the success rate is massive. Yeah. And then they see their rework activities go down and then they see the whole value. And then that's how we drive it across customers today. Yeah. No, I think that's very cool. I, I like pairing it with uh, the labor shortage and the consistency aspect across projects. Uh, Talk a, a little bit more about the kind of the the connection there between the the labor shortage and the the technology overlay. Yeah. So what we want to what we've seen right is that you put on this headset and it's like you have superpowers now, right? You can see everything that needs to be installed out on site. Yeah. So you know exactly where the cable trays are going in. You know exactly where the AHU units are going in. You can see where the clash is about to happen, right? And that's the sort of skill set that maybe someone who had 20 or 30 years of experience would actually be able to do from looking at drawings, right? Mm. And just walk in the site. You know, the experience tells them that, hey, like, you know, we're going to have a problem here. Right. Right. But someone who's, you know, five years into the industry or 10 years into the industry isn't going to be able to pick this up, right? So how do you kind of reduce that knowledge gap? And the way you'll be able to do that is through technology. And AR is a really, really effective format for being able to do that. So we want to be able to provide someone straight out of college the same knowledge uh, as someone who's got 20 years worth of experience. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, so do you have to reposition or rethink how you're, you're hiring and the type of people that you're hiring for? Should you hire somebody that has experience in AR or, or is it better to get somebody that has the construction experience and teach them? the AR workflow? It, it, so if I'm, let's say for example, a GC, right? I'm thinking about this. Yeah. Like I would try it on myself. And what you would find is that it's actually very simple to be able to pick up on. And the reason why is because all of us have iPhones now. We all have iPads. We all have smart technologies, right? Like we're not like completely inept at using tech, right? So it just right. needs to be simple enough to be able to use. And AR is a visual tool. Right, which means it's the most simple tool to be able to utilize, right? Because 3D is a natural language for us humans. 2D drawings and trying to teach someone 2D drawings, that's the challenging part. Teaching someone, you know, the 3D aspect, very simple and straightforward. So from a perspective of GC, you know, or even the subcontractors and the trade contractors, like keep hiring your construction guys. AR is simple enough for them to be able to utilize on their job sites. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, and if it's not, it's not good enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. as simple as that. For sure. One of my uh, friends that has been on the, the podcast a lot, she, Amy Mark, she talks a lot about the um, expected experience of construction is, is her phrase. And what she means by that is the we in our personal lives expect technology in everything. You know, we're, we order on Amazon and expect something to arrive 
in under two days. Uh, we are order a pizza and we can track it all along the the journey of it. But yet when we come into the world of construction, for some reason, we like have this huge disconnect of, of what we would demand in our personal life. We don't bring that into construction. I, I think that's a, a great example with AR and what you're talking about there that the, in the real world, we all are, have our, our phones very close by and, and are able to do incredibly advanced technology things without even thinking about it. And yet we come in construction and like, Oh yeah, we, you know, we're good. We'll just stick with paper. <laughs> You're like, This doesn't yeah. make sense. Why, why are you ex- accepting this as a, a reality? I a hundred percent agree. And I, and to be honest with you, I think a lot of times like, and it sounds odd to say this, but like, I, I like, I genuinely believe this, right. Is that I don't believe construction has failed to adopt technology. I feel like technology hasn't come up to par in order for it to be adoptable by construction, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. So I just genuinely feel like as, as a construction tech space, as an industry over the course of decades, like haven't developed out the right solutions, made it easy enough to use for the adoption of construction. So, and I know construction gets a bad rep for it, but I don't think it's anything to do with construction. I think the onus is actually on construction tech companies to be able to resolve those challenges, understand their users and develop out solutions that should be as easy to use. Because again, we all have iPhones, we all have iPads, we know how to use those, right? Yet when it comes to, I don't know, using um, like a 3D model viewer or Navisworks or those likes, you know, everybody struggles to drive it, right? Like we haven't figured out that part yet. Yeah, no, I more than agree with you that the the onus is is on the the technology coming in. Uh, one of the uh, kind of historical problems, if you will, of the the industry is some tech got probably brought in or uh, hit the market before it was really fully ready for prime time. I'm talking, you know, ten fifteen years ago, and mm-hmm. it, it gave it a bad rap. And so it's we have an extra hurdle now of kind of overcoming that. We're in a cool space in the the, the last three years. I, I think a lot of that barrier has started to to crack and and come down because a lot of people had to move to technology, uh, and mm-hmm. they realized that the technology is drastically different and much more advanced and much better for the job site now than what it was when they maybe tried it, you know, a, a decade or plus ago. Uh, so it's there's this renaissance happening in in construction technology, which is really fun and exciting to to see yeah like in the last five years if i think about it or six years since like 2017 when i when i joined xyz and when we were founded as a business like all the construction tech companies like in and around that time are like kind of coming to a level of maturity right now Mm -hmm. and it's really really cool to see like you know you got loads of people working on the kind of computer vision 360 camera type space you got a bunch of guys working on uh, the scheduling aspects as well um and and we're eventually going to see kind of consolidation begin to happen across these technologies and get them to start speaking to each other. Mm-hmm. And then that's when the industry as a whole world would really, really benefit. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, kind of speaking on the, the integration side, I know you guys have done a ton of work with Autodesk to develop a, an integration with the Autodesk Construction Cloud. Why was that important to, to have that partnership? And what does that do to, what does that provide the industry? Yeah. So I think 100% of the projects that we've pretty much been on, yeah, I'd say 100%, right? All primarily use Autodesk products, right? So it's kind of for us, it was a no brainer mm-hmm. um, to be able to plug into their system. So kind of starting off with like, okay, you know, you've got all these amazing 3D models, right? They're typically in Revit or Navisworks. All right, how do we get them into your headset? So we had to create a plugin, right? So it's a pretty natural fit for us to be able to start and make a one click export make it super seamless and so that was kind of the beginning of our journey with autodesk Uh, and then what we kind of saw as a natural kind of progression from that was that you know people have their headsets on out on site and you see an issue right you raise the issue in the headset but it doesn't kind of communicate so well back to the wider construction team so how can we improve that communication Mm. right rather than it just being like a pdf report that's automated Mm. right and so what we what we actually did was that we developed out a two way integration uh, on the BIM three sixty platform and um, as it was, and uh, such that whenever a user creates an issue out on site, it would actually automatically create an issue bubble 
within the federated model in the exact XYZ location. And it'll actually have the image attached as well with the overlay. And so it was this first of its kind integration with uh, Autosess. And so we saw like huge upside as a direct result of that. Um, and then from there, like our relationships kind of strengthened further and further. We've done a bunch of work on ACC and um, yeah, like uh, the team of Autodesk have been fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love seeing all the, the interoperability coming in between technology because that's the, you talked about scale earlier. That's the, the way to really scale the, the industry and, and help yeah. create that, that adoption more while widespread across all different tech forms of, of tech for sure. Absolutely. Uh, what do you see as the, the next step in the industrialization of the industry? So I think overall as an industry, we, we, we kind of got to get better at uh, costings, right? And budget issues and kind of uh, scheduling and delay issues, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think there'll be like a huge onus in being able to kind of acquire or uh, understand uh, previous data points as to why are these delays so often so happening, right? Like really kind of getting into the granularity of it, collecting that data from a number of different projects and then going, okay, having that predictability going forward as to what's going to happen in the next iteration of this job, right? The next phase of this project or the next project that this client may have. And then at that point in time, you're then looking at being able to score contractors and so on and so forth. And so that's really kind of where I see the industrialization going. And eventually we'll get to a stage where, you know, um, AR is accessible for all. Um, it's super easy to use. You're capturing everything that's happening out on site automatically. It's feeding back into a beautiful data lake that everybody can then access. So that's where we kind of see the whole space going. Um, and I think when we get to that stage as kind of as an industry, we'll really begin to thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that makes a ton of sense. And it kind of relates back to something that you were saying earlier too, uh, of creating that consistency across the, the different projects. And you're, you're never going to take all the variables out of construction because it's just inherent in the industry, but you're uh, minimizing and uh, putting it in, in proper context and being able to, kind of bake that into the the cake in a, a different way um yeah what about what about you sense, what do but... you see <laughs> it, like what, what do you see as kind of like the next kind of big industrial step for construction uh i, I see a ton of on the prefabrication side and i'm super uh intrigued and, and fascinated by how do we converge manufacturing and, and construction together i think that that's a, a huge uh it, it's already happening, but it, it, that's an evolution that we need to help get at scale. And it, I mean, it relates back on creating the, the consistency and, and creating that you know what you're going to get with a, a project and uh, being able not to necessarily mass produce huge buildings, but you're standardizing a lot of stuff. So, and productizing it. I think that's the, the, the really the, the next wave of, of, of construction. If we're looking out 15 years or so, I think that's going to be a lot yeah. more prevalent. Well, where do you see the constraints on the prefab side right now? Oh, uh, the challenge is, is being able to develop products and, and to shift the, the mindset because construction thinks very differently than, than manufacturing and those workflows and those processes are, are not, the same and not equal and obviously construction can't just totally embrace everything manufacturing because there are a ton of unique concerns and constraints building a, a job site that you don't have building a widget in a factory um, however I, I think that there's the the lean principles that, that come in from manufacturing and uh, being able to have some of that that standardization is critical for construction and construction has to really kind of pick and choose where they play in, in modular. Not everything needs to be prefab. Not everything needs to uh, be a widget in construction, but hmm. like a, a, a bathroom pod is a great example. A bathroom yeah. for all intents and purposes is a bathroom in every building. You can start to productize that and have a, a set 
you know, several options. Even I'm not saying there's one bathroom to <laughs> rule them all, but you, rule them you, all. you can have a couple <laughs> different bathroom types <laughs> and put them into the building. So then the designer knows, hey, I'm going to use bathroom A in in this project and put it all in, and they have all, all that detail ready to go in their design, and they just put the uh, widget in for uh, easy illustration, and they just put it in their design and they're done with it. That makes a ton of, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, like, have you seen much work on the data center side when it comes to prefab? Yeah. By yeah, chance. Doing some like, great stuff there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like really, really cool stuff there. Like <clears throat> there's been a few projects that I've been on where they've actually even been able to reduce like uh, the schedule down by like, like actual specific construction activities that had like a, a, uh, a 14 week lead time down to a two week installation time out on site. So start to finish was going to take them 14 uh, weeks. They managed to fix it down to two weeks and quality of the work, safety, redu- safety incidents, reductions, like all those benefits were like realized by the project and, and like, yeah, prefab in, in, in data center world is kind of bread and butter now. It's a given. Mm-hmm. And I think like I'm, be- I'm beginning to see it more and more in terms of other industries too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so kind of one of our, our core uh, topics and, and themes and passions on the, the podcast is around innovation. So what does innovation mean to you? What's kind of the first thing that pops into your head? First thing that pops into my head when it comes to innovation is optimization. Say so whether it be, uh, I like I, I consider innovation even like an, an improvement of 2%. That's innovation to me, mm-hmm. right? but also the innovation of improvement of, you know, 30, 40%, right? The, those kind of leaps and bounds, that's also innovation. So anything that in order to be able to optimize, that's what comes to mind when I think of innovation. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I like it. I'm, I'm all about those, those 1% improvements because over the long run, you look back and you just had a 40% jump up in a, a, a much shorter time than, than what you would have expected if you tried to do that, that 40% jump all in, in one go around. Um, so when it comes to innovation, you we learn up arguably more from our, our failures than our successes in, in this process. Is, is there a, uh, a thing that you we were trying out that, that didn't really go according to, to plan, but you had some big learning insights? Yeah. Uh, when we started the business, um, we actually were on the mission to be able to, you know, build this AI headset, et cetera. But we wanted to actually understand construction tech today. So what we actually did was we developed a subsidiary that was solely focused on laser scanning. And we were laser scanning major projects across Europe, including data center projects, right? And so <clears throat> we did this from, I think it was like 2017 to 2019, maybe. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really good because like, we learned a lot um, about kind of processes where the bottlenecks are, et cetera. But fundamentally, I think the biggest thing that we failed on was actually helping clients. All we were really and truly doing was telling them their problems, not able to prevent them, right? And I think like that was probably one of the biggest learnings there was that like this kind of how do we shift from reactive to proactive? And it really kind of became glaringly obvious. It sounds super simple to say now, but like it became glaringly obvious that like everything that is out there when it came to construction tech that we were trying, right? And the laser scanning side, optimizing, you know, a few percentage here and there. It was like fundamentally, your check and works after they've been installed. And so that's reactive in and of its nature. Mm-hmm. So you can't, like, how do we change that to a proactive process? And we only learned that through kind of failure in, 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 in that part of the business, right? Like, yes, we earned good money from it, but ultimately we didn't help anybody, right? We were just telling people their problems, not helping them prevent them. Mm-hmm. And so that was like the biggest kind of failure slash learning that we had. Yeah. How did you go about changing that mindset? So I think when you kind of phrase it like that, if you look at every other tech or every other process right now, you know, you go out on site, install the set of works, you call someone in to inspect the set of works, you then get a you know a verification of it in some form or another. Let's say, for example, it's laser scanning, you create a point cloud, you clean said point cloud, overlay against a design, you see if there's any deviation. If it's within tolerance, you're fine. If it's without tolerance, you have to make a decision. Do I update the model to reflect what's been built or do I go through a rework procedure? 
right? If you update the model, you know, that's the cheap and cheerful solution, right? If you go through a rework procedure, it's more expensive, but sometimes you, you do in fact have to go through a rework procedure. But let's say, for example, I go through the model updates, I update the model so far and so much until something important has to be installed and it no longer fits, right? Because these errors compound, you know, your wall's off, the next thing you know, the drawings are referencing the walls, the errors very quickly compound. Yeah. So that's the part where when you kind of actually map out the workflow of reality, yeah, of what ends up happening on projects today. And then you go, but imagine if you could just see what you needed to build and you build it right the first time. And everybody goes, well, that makes sense. Right. right. And then, the, and the next thing you know, they're looking through their entire project through the lens of, am I being reactive here or am I being proactive? Mm-hmm. And then they begin to look at other technology pieces. All right, how else can we fit in another piece on this? How can we be more proactive when it comes to cash flow forecasting and so on and so forth? And so that, it, we, we kind of see this huge shift in mentality from reactive to proactive accordingly. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And uh, pairing it with innovation, I think innovation is, is being as really simplistic as possible. And I, I love the, the reactive first proactive. And you said, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's so often that's a truly innovative concept. People are like, why didn't somebody think of that way before? <laughs> Now that's the hard part is to make it super simple. That's it, it's easy yeah. to make things super complex. It's way harder to make it straightforward and simple and you know very bite sized. Yeah, absolutely. It took us uh, many a year then uh, to even develop out the piece of tech. Yeah, <laughs> I believe it. Well, how do people find out more information on X Y Z Reality and connect with you? Yeah, um, on our website, it's probably the best place. Um, X Y Z Reality dot com. Um, uh, check out our check out our YouTube channel as well. We have a few uh, videos out there, a few testimonials here from our customers themselves, and a few explainers too. Uh, and LinkedIn, like uh, we're constantly posting about our progress, updates, partnerships, and whatnot. So it's a really good spot to be able to find us. And and for me personally, just uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. I'm super active on it, so uh, happy to help wherever I can. Awesome, perfect. Well, final question for you: If I could give you all power and you could snap your fingers to innovate one thing in construction what would you pick to innovate i would love to be able to like just have a dream my dream headset right put on the headset walk out on site and it literally just the only thing it does is flags issues to me right and it just takes all the headache out of kind of delivering a project just flags all the risks so you know where you need to focus your attention that for me would be like the superpower and that would just ena- I like that would enable everybody to be able to conduct their activities you could give it to the builder they'll be able to do their job so much faster so much better as well yeah that would be my superpower i like it i like it it's a good superpower for sure wally thanks so much for taking the time and, and joining the show today i really appreciate it todd thanks for having me on 